Good morning. Speaking of spontaneous. Yes. Uh, what we're doing today, we're going to talk about chapter 16, which is honestly one of the coolest chapters, in my opinion, of the whole Chem 221 through Chem 223 series. I'm backtracking a little bit from what we did last Monday, because I want to get you all up to speed with the things we're going to talk about. Um, Wednesday, there isn't a lab due, because last week was class presentations, and thank you, by the way, for those. Those are awesome. But we will talk about problem set number four. All right, so bring that along. Also bring a copy of the titration of weak acids lab. And if you have the instructions from the last lab we did, the acid and base titrations, we will reuse those instructions this week. It's basically, uh, we're going to look at a little bit more analytical version of the lab we did last time. So while we were kind of exploring everything last time, now we'll actually do some science. Woohoo! Anyway, and then Friday at 9 o'clock, quiz 4 will be due. I'll release it Wednesday night, uh, over solubility only. Any questions, that kind of stuff? Cool. So what we're talking about in this section, which gets me all jazzed up here, is we're really talking about how to predict if a reaction will occur or won't occur, like a thumbs up or a thumbs down kind of scenario. And uh, you can mix, of course, any chemicals together. A lot of them just sit there, but some of them like explode and stuff too. So scientists have always wanted to know like how to predict if a reaction is going to occur or not. And so when scientists have looked at all the reactions ever known, all right, they found that there's a really high probability of the reactants reacting if there's a dispersal of energy, of matter, or of both energy and matter. So if you can take a concentrated energy source and distribute it in a wider area, that's a higher probability of getting a thumbs up. On the other hand, if you have a concentrated source of matter and you somehow get the matter dispersed over a larger area, that's another way that there's a higher probability of it happening. And probability doesn't mean it's an absolute, of course, but it's much more likely to occur. Uh, this guy here, Boltzmann, uh, was the first one to kind of put this in motion as to what's going on. Now I want to show some chemical examples of what it means to have dispersion. So that's what we did, and we did see some of this last week, Monday. Consider a pair of flasks, one containing gas molecules, the other completely empty. If the flasks are connected at their mouths, Gas in the filled flask will move spontaneously to the empty flask by its molecular motions. Eventually, the distribution of molecules will be even throughout the flasks. The final state in which the matter is more dispersed is much more probable than the initial undispersed state. It's not very likely that the gas on both sides would automatically go to just one lobe of that, of that flask, all right? That doesn't sound right, and it's not seen. It's very low probability is how they talk about it. It's much more probable that concentrated gas would distribute evenly and stuff to both sides. And that's something that's seen. And the same thing happens like if we were to take uh, Juliana's water bottle or whatever she's drinking there, and you know, you pour it out, all right, it goes all over easily, all right? It's not very likely that the liquid could go automatically back into her container, all right? That's what it means to have matter dispersal. So we talked about this last Monday, but let's do it again. It says, which one of these represents matter dispersal? All right. Well, if you clean your messy room, you're organizing the stuff back into a smaller state. So that would not be matter dispersal. That would be matter organization, if you will. Um, if you take a gas and you condense it down to a liquid or even a solid, if you're uh, powerful enough, um, then that would also not be matter dispersal. Gases are all over the place, putting it down to a liquid, very small volume. If you crystallize a solid from a solution, the ions or whatever you've got are all over the place. As a solid, they condense down to a smaller phase, so that's not going to be it. But like we talked about last Monday, if you eat dinner, or any meal for that matter, you have a concentrated food source, it goes in your body, the energy goes all over, the waste go all over, lots and lots of energy dispersal or mass dispersal. So every time you eat something or drink something or anything like that, 
big time going to be dispersal. Now, ammonium dichromate is an orange solid, and when that reacts in the quote-unquote volcano reaction, it makes a whole bunch of other things. So that's like a concentrated version. This is a more dispersed version, so that wouldn't fly either. So if you see matter dispersal, or energy dispersal for that matter too, the reaction is much more likely to occur. Stored chemical potential energy is released from reactant molecules in an exothermic reaction. This energy spreads out or disperses over the product molecules and the molecules in the surroundings. When you eat food, as well as the matter being distributed through your body, etc., etc., you also have some energy dispersal. And in the body, it takes these different stored chemical energy bonds, breaks them up, and you end up then with movement to have energy and stuff to move around and breathe and stuff like that. Now, on a chemical level, you can think about something super concentrated, and all of a sudden you allow it to react. So maybe this is a piece of potassium in water or something like that. Anyway, the matter reacts, but the energy is distributed all around. So the energy was in this small chemical system, and then it's distributed to all the other solvent molecules. Maybe the actual container itself and stuff has gained some energy. All of these things are gaining energy from it. So concentrated energy is distributed into lots of uh, area, and that's kind of the idea there too. So again, if you can have matter dispersal, energy dispersal, or even better, both of them, much more higher probability of that reaction occurring. Now, in Chem 221 and Chem 222, and up to this chapter, exothermic reactions were basically what we used to describe if a reaction was going to occur or not. And you can maybe now see why exothermic reactions are probable. Because in an exothermic reaction, some kind of concentrated energy is distributed amongst a larger area. So the energy is being distributed. So most of the time, an exothermic reaction is a great way to tell if you're going to have a reaction which is going to occur. That energy dispersed in the exothermic reaction uh, is what makes it happen. So that's why negative delta H's and stuff like that we were always really involved with. In an exothermic reaction, you've got something concentrated like sugar, all right? And the sugar reacts and makes other stuff, all right? And that other stuff absorbs the energy that's from the sugar. So you have a lot more energy being dispersed all over. So usually, all right, exothermic reactions are the ones that occur. And by the way, as a quick reminder from last week, Monday, if you see something occur in chemistry, it's called spontaneous. And Julianne asked her, had a really cool comment on Discord the other day. Um, yeah, spontaneous just means like you see something happen. All right, it's not sitting there. Now, sometimes things happen and you don't see them too. I won't deny that. But if you see something happen, all right, like in this uh, value, like a TNT exploding or something like that, that's going to be spontaneous. And we'll talk more about that here. So let's look at a spontaneous reaction. This is the thermite reaction. They used this in Breaking Bad. It was a little too powerful in my opinion. This is highly exothermic. Lots and lots of energy being given off. There's no sound to this video, but this delta H here is negative. And again, most of the time, if you have an exothermic reaction, a negative delta H, that means you're gonna have spontaneous. So thermite here, this is a little glycerin there to warm it up. Uh, it's very exothermic, lots and lots and lots of energy given off. Maybe not as much as Breaking Bad, but still quite a bit of energy happens. Very exothermic. Uh, at the end there, you've got this kind of piece of iron and usually some white aluminum oxide kind of distributed around. Very, very energetic. But not all and ex, uh, not, excuse me, not all reactions that are spontaneous are exothermic. And that's In the center beaker is water at room temperature. To this we add solid ammonium nitrate. The ammonium nitrate dissolves. Usually, a reaction that occurs so readily is exothermic. But we see from the thermometer that this reaction is endothermic. The temperature of the water drops significantly. This reaction is not favored energetically, 
yet it still occurs. Now, in this reaction, you're adding ammonium nitrate to water, and you're stirring it up, and it dissolves. Whoopie doo! Not very exciting, right? No explosions, no color changes, the solid goes away. But why that's kind of cool from a chemistry perspective is that this is an endothermic reaction. The temperature went down, so energy was absorbed from the outside to the inside, from the surroundings to the system, is how scientists talk about it. But it occurred, all right? It was spontaneous in our chemistry world. We saw something happen. So again, most reactions that are spontaneous, that you see them happen, they're exothermic, all right? You can feel the heat being generated. This one, it would feel cold. So what this tells us is that we need more of an enthalpy to describe when a reaction is going to occur or not occur. All right? Most of the time, exothermic, the negative delta H's, will be enough to tell us, yes, this reaction will occur. But in this case, we have an endothermic value. Something's happening. It's not as exciting, but it is occurring. So we need a better model to describe when a reaction will occur or won't occur, when it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous. Questions? So this leads into what I ended up with last week about entropy. And entropy is a whole nother thermodynamic concept, in some ways uh, the opposite of enthalpy, in some ways parallel to enthalpy, as we'll see. Entropy is just a measure of disorderness, of matter being distributed, all right? So you can think about delta H as being the energy being distributed. S, entropy, is usually about matter being distributed. And uh, entropy is the reason why, at least in my science opinion, it's okay to have a messy room. <laughs> because entropy is fundamental to the universe, we're gonna see. And if your room gets messy, oh, entropy. Now your mom or parent or even yourself, your <laughs> other psyche, uh, might argue that that's not okay, but entropy is actually a force of the universe. And while, again, enthalpy is all about the energy released or energy absorbed, exothermic, endothermic, entropy is all about matter dispersal, all right? How much messiness you have, or even less messiness, depending on what you've got. Um, I talked about this, how Clausius of the Clausius Clapeyron was the first one to come up with the idea of entropy. Trope apparently is Greek for, tra for transformation. He wanted entropy to be kind of the opposite of enthalpy. Again, I like the yin-yang kind of symbolism from China, because I think that's kind of how enthalpy and entropy are, but you can use whatever system you want to figure this out. Um, energy, he wanted to be the giver of life, and entropy is the taker of way. I don't know how well that plays out, but it is still really cool and stuff to talk about. So entropy, arguably, is just as important as enthalpy. But up to this point, we've only dealt with enthalpy. But there's a lot of similarities between entropy and enthalpy, so we'll talk about more about what entropy is. Molecular motions are much more random in the gas state than in either the liquid or solid states. Motion in a liquid is more random than that of a solid. Gases tend to have the highest entropies, while solids have the lowest. In the problem set five handout for this class, there's a table, and in the table, there's gonna be a delta H for enthalpy, but there's also a whole bunch of values for entropy, and these are three, ten, these are three values of entropy, and you don't have to memorize any of them. We'll talk about some trends to help you out. Um, first of all, S is entropy. The little symbol zero right there, that means standard state, so we're not dealing with weird combinations of anything. And the numbers and stuff are the actual entropy values. Now, while enthalpy is usually in kilojoules, entropy is usually in joules. So FYI, we'll talk, we'll come back to that later. And the other thing about entropy is that there's a Kelvin unit in there, and we'll also talk about how to deal with that later. But anyway, when you look at the table, if you have, for example, representative solid, liquid, and gas values, solids are always smaller entropies than liquids, and liquids are always smaller entropy than gases. 
So remembering that entropy is all about matter dispersion, well, solids are very, very concentrated, very small areas. Liquids, on the other hand, kind of spread out a little bit more, so more matter dispersal. And finally, gases are the anarchists of phase matters. I think they're all over the place. They can't be contained. So the numbers are getting bigger, representing more and more entropy. All right? So this would have the highest entropy. That would be the lowest entropy. We're going to see here in a little bit that entropy values are always positive. We're going to see it right now. The third law of thermodynamics is another one of these big laws of energy transfer. The first law was just that uh, energy can't be created or destroyed. We're going to talk about the second law in a little bit, but the third law says that only pure elements in perfectly formed crystals at zero Kelvin have zero entropy. And that basically means you're never going to have zero entropy. All right? Entropy values for individual compounds like this, always positive numbers. All right? If you happen to have the pure crystal at zero Kelvin, I think Julian last Monday said you can't even get to zero Kelvin, which is correct. Uh, yeah, it's not going to happen. All right? So entropy values always going to be positive, and you can use the table to get those kind of numbers. Any questions on that? So if you saw something like this, what has the highest entropy at 25 degrees Celsius, all right? There's a couple of things that you can see. First of all, unobtainium is only from the Avatar movie, which apparently the second one's coming out, which I can't believe. But anyway, that's a made up thing, so just ignore answer E. It's your instructor being cheesy. What I would do on this one, if I didn't have a table of values, is automatically look for the gas because gases always have more entropy than solids and liquids, all right? So if you look those values up, it's absolutely the highest. Gases are always higher than liquids, and liquids are higher than solids. So I would automatically say, yep, yeah, that's going to be the xenon, all right? Gases have more entropy than anything else. Yeah. As far as pure elements go, does the electronegativity of an element have anything to do with the entropy? Cool. Electronegativity helps us to understand sometimes like why uh, certain atoms are in the middle of a molecule or why some molecules uh, react with each other, but it doesn't have anything to do with the entropy. Um, entropy is just about um, taking matter concentrated and making it less concentrated or vice versa. And I, I'm unaware anyway, Juliana, of any application where that would be right in. But it has its totally powerful uses too, so very cool. I guess I was just sort of curious because yeah. xenon is one of those noble gases mm -hmm. about whether it would be lower in entropy because it's less likely to react. Right on. So it's not about the uh, behavior of it's not about the behavior of the molecule. It's about the phase of the molecule. All right. So you could have like iron gas or water gas or something like that, and those would also be like super high. You know. So um, we're not thinking in this con like electronegativity would be like a question we could think about if it reacts or not. You know. But here we're just trying to analyze uh, which one has the most uh, matter distribution if you will. So it's more about the phase of matter than the, if it reacts or not. Good question. Very cool comment. Other questions? So uh, here's just some examples. Bromine, uh, when it exists, is kind of a nasty brown, kind of reddish liquid. Uh, but it's usually in pretty good contact with the vapor phase. But again, gases always have more entropy than liquids, all right? And it doesn't matter how it reacts or anything like that. We're just talking about the phase of matter and like how it is, like Julianne asked about. If you have like ice and liquid water, uh, solids, very, very concentrated, not a lot of change. On the other hand, liquids have a lot of craziness around them, for lack of a better phase. Um, so more matter distribution would be higher. Heptane at 1500 Kelvin has significantly greater molecular motion than it does at 200 Kelvin. The substance has greater entropy at 1500 Kelvin than at 200 Kelvin. Now, because entropy values have a temperature component, 
component to their unit. There is a difference in entropy when you start changing temperatures. And this is just an example of heptane, which is sometimes an ingredient in gasoline, stuff like that. But anyway, higher temperatures will all in same phase will always have more entropy than the lower temperature. So heptane in both of these is a gas, all right, 200 Kelvin versus 1500 Kelvin. And we would say that the higher temperature gas would have more entropy than the lower temperature gas. And if you think about it, like it's kind of dreary out today. I mean, it's better than it was yesterday, I guess. But anyway, not kind of feeling it as much here. But when it's really nice outside, I'm like, yeah, good weather, and I'm running around. All right, maybe it's just me, I'll be honest. But anyway, I feel more energetic at hotter temperatures than I do at colder temperatures. And that's basically uh, what molecules do too. And in this little graph, here's the 200. Molecules aren't moving around as much, but up here when it was 1500, there was lots and lots of up and down as the molecules vibrate, rotate, and all that kind of jazz. In general, the more complex a molecule, the greater its entropy. We can see this trend by comparing three alkene molecules. The amount of motion for each molecule translates into entropy. The more motion overall, the greater the entropy. These molecules um, are all alkanes, and uh, in Chem 222, an alkyl group was like methyl, and methyl with a hydrogen became an alkane. So methane, ethane, and propane are the first three of these alkanes. Uh, but that's not so important here. What is important is that as your molar mass and number of atoms starts getting bigger, you will see more entropy. So in this molecule, you can think about there's basically five atoms, all right? And in ethane, there's six. And believe it or, or no, wait, eight, I'm sorry, I wasn't counting correctly there. Um, the more atoms you have, the more variation there's going to be. Like sometimes molecules will be in sync and sometimes they'll be opposite. And you can imagine as you start adding more and more and more and more, you have more and more variations. Um, here's noble gases, and you can see here, here's the xenon like we talked about earlier. Um, xenon has a lot more entropy than smaller helium, all right? Uh, it's able to move around a little bit more. So as complexity increases, entropy increases as well. The entropy of a solid depends on the strength of the forces holding it together. The weaker the attractive forces, the greater the motion of the ions in the crystal lattice and the greater the entropy. Coulomb's law basically says that a positive one, negative one charge is strong, but a positive two, negative two charge is even stronger. The atoms hold on even more. And we see that in entropy as well. Now in this little graphic, the Na's and F's were actually moving a little bit more than the Mg's and O's, because the Mg's and O's have this double handshake. The positive two, negative two is like a double handshake. The positive one, negative one is like a single handshake. So again, assuming all else is equal, positive one, negative one will have a higher entropy than positive two, negative two. And if you had a positive three, negative three, like aluminum nitride, you would say it's probably even smaller than the positive two, negative two. So these are kind of like trends, and of course there's always variations, but more or not, it's more often than not, these things work pretty well. When potassium permanganate dissolves, its crystal lattice is broken apart, leading to an increase in disorder, and therefore an increase in entropy. This last one is a solid dissolving in water to make a solution. And in a solution, you have the solutes, which are the little blue and those little kind of yellow molecules there in the middle. And they're surrounded by solvents, which are waters, the little red with the little small whites on them. Usually making a solution is an entropy favored process, which means you will have more entropy upon making a solution than you will compared to the pure liquid and the pure solute. But that's not always the case. But if you have to guess, and that's kind of what I'm throwing it up here, more often than not, solutions have higher entropy than the pure substances they came from. And that kind of makes sense because now you've got all these uh, solutes and so surrounded by solvents, everything's moving around, you have a lot more chaos, all right? Uh, on the other hand, there are some exceptions, so this is the weakest of these kind of things that we're seeing. 
So here's a question, which one represents an increase in entropy? And remember the things that we've seen so far, we can think about what's happening. So freezing water would be going from a liquid to a solid. And we've seen that generally speaking, solids have less entropy than liquids. So this would not be giving us an increase in entropy. We're going from a higher entropy liquid to a lower entropy solid. On the other hand, if you have water, liquid water, and you're turning it into a gas by boiling it, well, liquids have less entropy than gases. Probably boiling water would be a pretty good call because like I said, solids to liquids, liquids to gas, you always see an increase in entropy. So that would certainly give you an increase in entropy. Now, if you crystallize a salt, you're taking some kind of ions and solution and you're making it into a solid, you're basically forming a solid, the lowest entropy phase, if you will. That's probably not gonna happen. That's not gonna be an increase in entropy, excuse me. And this one is kind of interesting. We have two gas molecules going to one gas molecules. So two pieces going to one piece. And that's something else which is probably not entropy favorite. Entropy wants more pieces, not less pieces, all right? So going from two NOs, two molecules of gas, to one molecule of gas would not be as favorable entropy-wise as if we went from one molecule to two molecules, from a concentrated source to a more distributed source. Any questions on So this is just an example of the table that you have in problem set number five. You can also go to mhchem.org slash thermo. I think I've got that set up. If you don't find the table of entropy, let me know. But anyway, if you look at all these values, all of these numbers are positive, all right? Because they're not perfect crystals at zero Kelvin, which is like never. There's no negative numbers, uh, stuff like that. If you look carefully, I'm trying to find a good example here. Um, well, here's water as a gas and water as a liquid. You can see how the liquid is less than the gas, and that's very, very common. Uh, positive one, negative one versus positive two, negative two. This one has lower entropy, stuff like that. Here's the alkanes with their increase in entropy. Um, diamond has a smaller entropy than graphite. Those are both allotropes of carbon, which means different forms of carbon. Uh, diamond is very, very rigid, doesn't move around a lot. Um, so that's why it has a lower entropy than graphite. So again, making graphite from diamond is one of these things that's thermodynamically gonna happen, but it's so slow. The kinetics in the background are always playing a factor. Here's carbon as a gas, and you can see it's so much higher than both of those solids and stuff. So none of these values are be things you'd have to ever memorize, and it's nice to have the table next to you if you have it. Okay, in Chem 221, and maybe a little bit in Chem 222, we looked at these two equations, and I want to just remind you about them because we're going to see equivalent things with entropy. Remember, entropy and enthalpy are kind of like two sides of the same coin, and there's a lot of similarities between them. Now in Chem 221, and again a little bit in Chem 222, we looked at the Q equals MC delta T expression. And that's for if you have um, a change in temperature, but you're not changing the phase. So for example, if you wanted to find the energy required to heat liquid water from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius, well, if you know the mass in grams, the heat capacity is just a fundamental part of any substance, water, 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin, and delta T, final temperature minus initial temperature. So if you're going from 20 to 40 degrees, you would have 40 minus 20, final temperature minus initial. Um, you can use delta T in Celsius or Kelvin, doesn't matter. And the Q that comes out is just a number of joules. Now, if the key to Q is being transferred at constant pressure, which is like all the time in this class, Q sub P is what enthalpy really is. It's heat transferred at constant pressure. That's kind of a small nuance that you don't have to worry about, but I do want you to know that's really what the official definition is. 
So if you're just heating a substance or cooling it down, Q equals MC delta T does a really great job. But what happens if you have a phase change, if you actually change your liquid water to gaseous water? That's when we used this thing right here. And I wish I had a better way to express it, but it's some kind of a mass times some kind of a heat of something. And I put them both in quotes because heats of something have different kinds of units. So for example, 333 joules per gram is the heat of fusion. That's the heat required to turn ice into liquid water. And the units you can see have units of grams. On the other hand, here's the heat of vaporization for water, 40.7 kilojoules per mole. And that's required to make liquid water go to gaseous water. So if you only had a kilojoules per mole, then your mass term here would have to be so many moles. On the other hand, if your heat of something is joules per gram, then you could use just grams here. When you have a phase change, you're not changing the temperature, you're just changing like liquid to solid, or you're changing gas to liquid, or liquid to gas. Either way is totally fine. Um, we use both of these things in Chem 221 in Chapter 5. Uh, we used them in Chem 222 a little bit too in Chapter uh, 10, uh, where we did the phase changes and stuff. Any questions on that? Okay. Later on, you're like, whoa, this really is blowing my brain. I don't remember and stuff. I can send you like notes and references, handouts and stuff to help out. So just let me know. Okay. Uh, we looked at diagrams like this in Chem 221 and Chem 222. Um, we figured out the heat being transferred. For example, if you had ice at negative 50 and you wanted to heat it to steam at 100 degrees. Well, there was an MC delta T to go from negative 50 to zero. Uh, there was a heat times a heat of something times the mass to go from ice to liquid water. To go from liquid water at zero to liquid water at 100, we use MC delta T again. Heating, evaporating the water, liquid to gas, there was another mass of something times the heat of something. And you added up these individual pieces to give the overall energy. Um, if you go from solid to gas, uh, all the values are positive. On the other hand, if you go from gas back to ice, all of the values were negative, exothermic. It takes energy to turn solids to liquids and liquids to gases, but you actually get energy out turning gases back to liquids and liquids back to solids. So just FYI. Any questions? Okay. Now, in Chem 223, because we're going to deal so much with entropy, sometimes it's nice to know the entropy of a transition as well, all right? And this is an example of how to do an entropy change for a temperature change. So instead of using the MC delta T thing that we used with enthalpy, for entropy, it's NC natural log T2 over T1. And in a future class, you might look into where this equation comes from. For right now, I just want you to see this so that if you ever have to do this kind of calculation, you'll be good to go. So in Chem 221, MC delta T was a type of delta H. In this class now, delta S is NC natural log, et cetera, et cetera. N is moles, N is usually moles in chemistry, and C is the heat capacity. Now in this case, it's a molar heat capacity, so instead of joules per gram Kelvin, you'd have joules per mole Kelvin, something like that. And then T2 and T1 are just Kelvin temperatures. So when you throw all this in, you're gonna get the value. So here's an example. If you have 0.499 moles of water and you're heating it from 281 Kelvin to 294 Kelvin, well, plug it into this expression. To figure out the molar heat capacity of water, 4.184 has joules per gram. There's 18.02 grams in a mole. So the grams on top here and the grams in the bottom there cancel out. So 75.40 is a number we haven't used before, but that's the molar heat capacity of water. 
Uh, it's just another number. Sometimes in the handbook of chemistry and physics, they list these things. But anyway, moles times this heat capacity, natural log T2 over T1, value of delta S here, 1.70 joules per kilo. Now this is an example of an entropy change. All right, we've been looking at individual entropy values, but this number is a little bit different now because it's the entropy change upon heating water from 281 to 294. And like I said earlier, entropy is kind of like me, cold days, not really feeling it, warm days, excited. Well, in that cheesy explanation, sound effects not necessary, this is me, kind of dreary, colder temperature. This is me, excited, woohoo! So my entropy goes up as the temperature goes up, just like in this case, the water entropy goes up as well. Cheesy example. Questions? Now, instead of having mass times heat of something, you can use an entropy phase change of Q over temperature, all right, where Q is the heat transferred in the phase change. Now this is a little bit weird. In enthalpy, Q for a phase change was the mass of something times the heat of something. The entropy change is the same thing. It's mass of something times heat of something, but you divide by the temperature. And we'll come back to that here in a little bit, what that means. Now, if you take liquid water and you heat it to gaseous water and you do the mass times heat of something, you'll find that the value is 40,700 joules per mole. And this is actually something we did in Chem 221. So that's the value there of Q. So if you have this temperature... When liquid water converts to the vapor state, its molecules disperse over a greater region of space. This represents an increase in entropy. So entropy, again, is the measure of disorder, all right? And if this is at the boiling point of water, that would be 100 Celsius, or 373 Kelvin. So the entropy change for this reaction, 40.7 kilojoules, or 40,700 joules, divided by the temperature, entropy positive 109 joules per mole Kelvin. So, these last two slides, all right, are trying to make connections between enthalpy and entropy. And I'll be honest, we're not going to use either of these equations that much, but I do want you to know that if you become an entropy scientist, uh, there's all these equivalent equations and stuff that correlate well with enthalpy. Also, I want you to start realizing that these are changes in entropy. And these two values here were both positive numbers, but sometimes they're negative too. Okay. So, let's say you wanted to calculate the entropy for the vaporization of xenon at its boiling point if we know the heat of vaporization is 12.6 kilojoules per mole. And I'm sure that's exactly what you wanted to figure out this morning. But anyway, it's actually not as bad as it might sound. The heat of vaporization is this Q value. When you're turning a liquid to a gas, that's a vaporization. So the Q is 12.6 kilojoules per mole, and we'll divide it by the Kelvin temperature, all right? So if you take 12.6 and you divide it by the temperature in Kelvin, I turned it back into joules, so 12.6 times 1,000 is 12,600 you end up with 75.9 joules per mole Kelvin. That's a change in entropy. It's a positive number because you're going from liquid to gas. Those kind of things are always entropy favored. This is the way then that you as a scientist could calculate it if you want to. Any questions? Do we have to go to joules or can we leave it at kilojoules? You could absolutely leave it at kilojoules. Okay. Um, to make the answers look like these answers, I turned it into joules, but there's nothing wrong with keeping it in kilojoules. You bet. Good question. Other questions? The only one that kind of bugs me, though, is this is the calorie. <laughs> um, the science calorie and the food calorie sound so similar, but they're quite different. So as long as you stay away from the calories, you're 
Um, so just like in Chem 221, you could do a, a enthalpy change going from ice at minus 50 to a, a lick, to a gas at 100 degrees Celsius and figure it out. You can do the same kind of thing with entropy. All right, and again, we're not going to do so much of that, but if you get into a course where this is something that you need to figure out, it's not that bad or anything. Okay. Now, there was another thing we did in Chem 221 that's going to be really helpful in this section. And in Chem 221, we found the delta H enthalpy change for a reaction. And it was always adding up all the enthalpy of products minus all the enthalpy of reactants. And I want to go through an example of this because this will be helpful in the stuff we're going to do here. So in Chem 221, if I would have said find the enthalpy for this reaction right here, we would have looked at the enthalpy for liquid water and multiplied that by 2. That would have been all the enthalpies of the products. And from that, we would have subtracted all the enthalpies of the reactants. So if you look these values up in a book, all right, liquid water is minus 285.85, and that's just something you look up. Another thing from Chem 221, though, that we saw was that the elements in their pure states had values of zero. So hydrogen's normal state is a gas, and oxygen's a gas. They're going to have zero enthalpy values. So you take all the enthalpies of the products minus all the enthalpies of the reactants, and this would have been the number that you get right there, minus 571.70 kilojoules per mole. So I'm bringing this back here because A, if you need to find the delta H of a reaction, delta H of products minus delta H of reactants. This is the summation sign, it just means add up all of them. In this case, for this reaction, we only had one product, but there were two reactants, and that's why there's like two pieces right there, all right? We'll do stuff like this for entropy. It's not hard, you need a table, blah, blah, blah. Um, the other thing, though, is that values of delta H are zero for elements in their standard states. So hydrogen as a gas and oxygen as a gas both have zero. If we would have had liquid oxygen, all right, that would not be zero. That's not its normal state, all right? But for delta H, we can do this kind of stuff, which is pretty crazy. Um, finally, notice that delta H values will sometimes be negative, sometimes they're positive, and they can absolutely, as you see, be zero. But remember, entropy values are always going to be positive numbers. Any questions? Okay. Now, delta S values for a reaction are calculated in the same way we just did for delta H. So this is a problem now we can use with that table of entropy values from problem set 5. So let's say I said uh, calculate delta S for this reaction right here. No problem. We'll add up all of the entropies that are products and subtract all the entropies that are reactants. So just like we did in the last problem, we would take the entropy of the product, water, and multiply it by 2. We would then subtract 2 times the entropy of the hydrogen and 1 times the entropy of the oxygen. Um, so again, same thing, look these values up in the table. Now, all of these values are going to be positive numbers. There's no zeros and no negatives. And again, here's liquid water right here, here's hydrogen gas, here's oxygen gas. So when you do this, products minus reactants, but for entropy now, you end up with an entropy change, which is negative, all right? Now, Individual entropy values are positive, but you can have a negative entropy change. And uh, last Monday, I did the really cheesy thing, and I dropped the papers, and they went all over. Uh, well, having papers being distributed, that's an increase in entropy, more disorder. But if I take my papers, and I organize them back again, woohoo! Well, that's what delta S of a negative, a delta S that's negative means, all right? You're taking all this disordered stuff and you're making it more ordered. So making liquid water from hydrogen gas and oxygen gas 
Entropy disfavor. That's what that number says. It's becoming more organized. So, punchline of this slide. Entropy of a reaction, products minus reactants. Look up these individual values. Products minus reactants, multiply them by the stoichiometry, if it's there. Delta S can be positive or negative. Individual entropy is always positive, but delta S, the change in entropy, can be positive or negative. So what it's saying here is that this reaction is going to have a decrease in entropy. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. We're going from gases to liquids, lots of extra energy running around, volume, down to a more concentrated form. We're also going from three moles of reactant to two moles of product. So that's also becoming more concentrated. Both of those reasons, that's why this delta S value here is negative. Entropy is not happy with this reaction, so. Any questions? Okay. So here's an example of copper metal reacting with oxygen to make copper 2 oxide. And it says calculate the entropy change. You don't have to figure it out with me unless you want to, but again, what you would do, products minus reactants. So we take the copper 2 oxide, this number, and subtract the copper metal We'd also subtract one half of oxygen. And remember that all things in these calculations will have non-zero values. Like with delta H, like oxygen would have been zero, but not when it comes to entropy. So when you plug this into your calculator, it comes out to be minus 93.12 joules per Kelvin. And again, this is a negative delta S and that kind of makes sense because it's a gas going to a solid, which is never a good call in entropy. And you also have one and a half moles of reactant going to one mole of product. So that's going to a more concentrated form too. So for both of those reasons, entropy is not happy here. Any questions? I think this is the final part from Chem 221. The, um, another thing we looked at in Chem 221 was called a heat of formation. And the table of thermodynamic properties from problem set five, those are technically heats of formation. And what that means is it's how much energy it takes when you get out, whatever, to make one mole of product when all the reactants are elements in their standard states. So if you look in that table, they're technically delta HF values, heats of formation. And again, that just means it's like the energy per mole, and you assume that all the reactants are elements. Well, you can have an entropy of formation as well. And in an entropy of formation, you would have one mole of product, and again, all the reactants would be elements in their standard states. So for water as a liquid, all right, one mole of product, reactants in their standard states. So you can actually calculate these things if you'd like to. Here's the value again for liquid water. Here's hydrogen and oxygen. We'll multiply the oxygen by one half. This number right here would be the entropy of formation for liquid water. So what this is saying is that forming a mole of liquid water from reactants in their standard states gives you an entropy decrease, 163.5. The punchline, again, is that if you see the F, whether it's on a delta S or a delta H or any other kind of thing, one mole of product and reactants are elements in their standard states. So in this question, I'm essentially asking you to find which one of these is a formation equation. And again, remember the punchline, one mole of product and all reactants have to be elements in their standard states. So as an example, this one, uh, H2S, all right, well, S8 is the natural form of sulfur, which you don't have to know. Hydrogen's the standard form. So these are reactants in their standard states, but it's not one mole of product. All right, so that's not a formation reaction. 
that would actually be just some kind of general delta S reaction. But if you, and like here's two compounds, we don't have elements in their standard states, these are ions, that doesn't count. If you look at this long enough though, answer D, we have one mole of product being made, and all the reactants, sodium, oxygen, hydrogen, are elements in their standard states. So the only one in that list that's a true entropy of formation, or a formation reaction, is going to be D, one mole of product, Reactants are elements in their standard states. Any questions? Okay, this is a good place to take a break. Uh, the next slide will start another kind of section here. So it's about 9.52, 9.57 or so. We'll come back, knock this out.